Hi, so we're looking at uh, Unit 3.35, Working in Teams, and we've worked our way to the last learning outcome. So this learning outcome, as you can see, is a bit of a long one. So it is know how to build and maintain interpersonal relationships with colleagues. So we're going to go through the criteria. So 6.1 is explain the importance of creating good interpersonal relationships at work. 6.2 is to explain the differences between positive, negative, and constructive feedback. 6.3, describe the indications and common causes of disagreements in work teams. 6.4, explain the approaches people use to resolve conflict situations in uh, work teams. And then we've got two merit questions. So the first one is analyze the characteristics of good interpersonal relationships with work colleagues. Then the second merit is to describe the six-step conflict management process. And again, we have two distinctions. So first one is to analyze the characteristics of effective feedback. And the second is to evaluate feedback to assess its effectiveness. So let's make a start on 6.1. And just a bit of a recap, 6.1 is explain the importance of creating good interpersonal relationships at work. So when you've got interpersonal relationships, this actually just refers to a, a an association that happens between individuals, so employees or people who work together in the same place. So uh, they can share a special bond with each other and uh, they can have a good relationship with each other, a good friendship, and it helps them to deliver to their best abilities. Now, it's quite important to have an interpersonal relationship at work, so we've put down the importance of these in the next few slides. So, number one is an individual who spends around eight to nine hours in their organization. So, they spend quite a lot of time in the organization, and it's not really possible for that person to work all by themselves. Because, as we know, humans, we're not machines. We can work long hours, but we need people to talk to, to interact with, people that we can share our feelings with, you know, have a bit of a gossip with. So just imagine you're at work and you've got no friends and you're going to feel quite alienated and you might feel anxious as well so or even feel stressful because you've got no one there to actually just even go and have a bit of a gripe at if you're feeling a little bit bad about something or even to bounce off some ideas. So it's nice to have a bit of a relationship or a friendship or someone that you can talk to when you're at work. So number two is a single brain alone can't take all the decisions. So we need, and it's true, you can't make decisions all by yourself. There might be a certain extent that you can do, but a lot of decisions in the decision-making process should be discussed with colleagues. So you need somebody there or some colleagues there that are able to look at the pros and the cons, give you different solutions, give you an idea, someone that you can brainstorm and reach a good idea or a good strategy. And this is in a way to do this would be to call meetings, uh, you know, at least once a week or a couple of times a week, even better, just to communicate with each other. Number three is interpersonal relationships have a direct effect on the organizational culture. So if you have any misunderstandings or any confusions or if you've fallen out with someone, it can lead to negativity in the workplace. So uh, to be honest, conflicts will lead you nowhere. They'll just spoil your work environment. They'll give you a lot of anxiety and stress. So it's best to try and avoid these situations or Better yet, if something has happened to tackle it head on and say, I didn't like that situation there, just go and try and get it resolved before it turns into an even bigger problem. Number four is we need people around who can appreciate our hard work and motivate us. So it is important that we have trustworthy co-workers and it's also important that we've got somebody there that will actually say, well done, you've done a fantastic job or, you know, give you a pat on the back or a thumbs up and then also tell you, this, you know, you made a mistake here, this needs fixing, giving you good feedback. 
So it's nice to have mentors at work who can assist you. Number five is to, it always pays to have individuals around who really care for us. So when you do have a bad time at work, there's a bit of a crisis or an issue has arisen, you do need to talk to somebody at work. So if you have no one around that you trust or that you feel comfortable talking to, it can be difficult and you'll probably take those stresses home with you. But if you've got somebody in your um, organization that you feel comfortable approaching and you trust them, then you can actually fall back onto them and when you have an issue or a crisis at work. And number six, the last point in this one is an individual needs to get along with fellow workers to complete assignments within the stipulated fr uh, time frame. So this is where teamwork comes in. You need to be working along with your colleagues so that you can get your tasks done, so you can get your goals met and uh, you're working towards your responsibilities, delegate your uh, tasks if you can do, work on your specialization, you know, confer with each other and just get that, that project or that objects or those goals that you're working towards, get them achieved within the time that they need to be achieved. So on to 6.2, which is explain the differences between positive, negative and constructive feedback. So when we're having feedback, this actually occurs in our work environments. So it's normally a reaction to an action or a behavior that's happened. So for example, it might be customer feedback. So you might have somebody coming in, either bought something from you and then they fill out a bit of a feedback form. Or it can be a um, operational feedback where you're getting feedback from somebody within your organization. Now, to provide effective feedback, it is extremely critical to maintain a capable workforce. So a good part of getting feedback is to look at the data and look at credible sources before you even uh, go ahead and try and give any feedback. So make sure that it's valid information that you're looking at. So sources of feedback in the workplace. So we're just going to look up different uh, sources over here. So first is customers. So customers are a quite important source of feedback. You can solicit feedback from customers about individuals, teams, groups, management, performance. You can talk to them about um, or gain feedback about policies and procedures within your work environment. Complaint forms, customer focus groups. So there's quite a few ways you can get feedback. Number two is objective data. So you look at statistical me measures, key performance indicators or KPA, looking at real time data. So if you're working in a shop, you might be looking at your sales figures for that day or that week or that month. Your peers, so you're going to get uh, feedback from your coworkers who do similar jobs or somebody who has a better understanding of a particular uh, job and you can actually get a better idea of what that person's performance is like. And it gives you a different perspective for the feedback process because it's not just you looking at the person that you want to give feedback to, it's, there's another source there as well. Then you've got supervisors, managers, and team leaders. And you can actually get feedback from them. They'll have an insight into company policies, procedures. They'll look at the trajectory. They'll have a quite a good comprehensive understanding of the employee's performance. Then you have subordinate. So this is called upward feedback. And it's where you, uh, it's a method of where you allow subordinates to provide to provide feedback about the manager style. So it's not only just you getting feedback and giving it to your colleagues or to your team members you're a manager of, it's about gaining feedback about your own style as well. And then you can adapt and adjust in accordance to what they're saying to you. 
And there are different types of feedbacks that can be given to uh, employees, and they do actually have a major impact on their performances. So you've got constructive feedback. This is where you're giving specific information. It's very issue focused and it's based on observations. And there are four types of constructive feedback. There's negative feedback, where you're telling them about corrective comments about past behaviors or projects, and it'll focus on a behavior that wasn't successful, and then you're letting them know what the issue is so that it shouldn't be repeated. Then you have positive feedback, is where you're giving them affirmation, you're giving them comments about past behavior, which was good, what was successful, and what they should carry forward. Then you've got something called negative feed forward. This is corrective comments about the future performances, and it'll focus on the behavior that should be avoided in the future. And then you've got positive feed forward, which is, again, affirmations, and is giving you comments about future behavior. And it's saying that you should focus on this type of behavior for your performances in the future. So part of being an effective manager or a supervisor is actually knowing what type of feedback to give. And when you've learned how to give this constructively, it can be a, big, a very good tool um, that you can use to direct your employees or your team members in. So you need to uh, make sure that you're giving them feedback, which is constructive. So if you can't think of a constructive purpose for giving feedback, don't speak to them at all. There's no point. Focus on the description rather than the judgment. So don't pass a judgment. Feedback isn't about the person, it's about the action, about what performance they're doing or what tasks they're completing. So focus on the actual description of what you're talking about, whether it was right or wrong, or if it was good or bad, or you need to demonstrate this, that, and the other, or you can say you're you know, so a good example for this was you can say you demonstrate a high degree of confidence when you answer customer questions about registration procedures, rather than just saying, oh, your communication skills are good. You're giving them the same information, but you've done it in a way where they've got a nice amount of detail about exactly what you're talking about. So if someone just came up to me and said, your communication skills are good, I'd probably think they're referring to me greeting someone. But if you give me that type of detailed information that was sent in the uh, example above, where you demonstrate a high degree of confidence, then I know exactly what you're talking about. So you should focus on observation rather than interference. So focus on looking at what someone is doing. Look at them, listen to them, observe their behavior, and then don't interrupt. So an example of this is when you can say to a person is when you gave that student the financial aid form, you tossed it across the counter. Then rather than you uh, saying that um, you don't want to put any assumptions in. So you shouldn't be saying, oh, I assume you or I suppose you give forms in this way all the time. Because you don't want to put an assumption on top of what you're thinking. It could have been something that's done without even being thought about it, it might be something that fell out of their hand. So you don't want to put assumptions on. And again, focus on behavior rather than the person. So refer to what an individual does rather than what you're actually imagining that they do. Number five is to provide a balance of positive and negative feedback. So if you only give positive feedback or negative feedback, people, the people that you're talking to, they're going to distrust that feedback. They're going to say, oh, she's always saying nice things about me. Uh, she must be having me on or she might be taking the make out of me or she probably doesn't even know what's going on herself. Or, oh, she's always coming and giving me negative feedback. I don't think she likes me. I don't like her. You know, but if you give it a nice good mix of positive and negative it will be more whole rounded. Then the last point is to be aware of feedback overload. So you don't want to give too much information. So you might have a page full of information that you've noted down from observing someone, but only select a couple of points or two or three points and give them feedback about that 
those points that you're talking about. If you go ahead and give too much feedback, it'll be way too much information and the person you're talking to won't know where to focus on or they'll feel disheartened. So on to 6.3, where we're going to describe the indications and common causes of disagreements in work teams. So when we're doing feedback on here, they can cause issues and disagreements. Sometimes you can give somebody a positive feedback and they'll be happy, they'll be good, they'll be like, fine, that's fantastic. But if you give them negative feedback, that might create some sort of disagreements within the work team. Or you might have somebody else saying, oh, I, I don't understand why I've been given this negative feedback. I do my job perfectly fantastically. So that can cause an issue within uh, teams. So every when you're at work, conflict is inevitable. It unfortunately is, but it should never be ignored. So over time, little grievances, little issues can turn into long-standing antagonisms. So if they're not addressed in a timely manner, they will escalate. So, and this might uh, affect the whole employee role. It might affect customer satisfaction so as a supervisor or a manager you need to be aware of these conflict signs and you know you need to be able to address them quickly and also try and bring your workers together to discuss and resolve any type of disagreements that have happened so one could be poor communication that might uh, cause a conflict at work so uh, for example a manager might have reassigned an employee's tasks and um, they might ask the employee's co-worker to do certain things, but they've not actually communicated this to the employee, which will make someone feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm, what's going on. You gave all my jobs to this person over here, or you're taking my tasks away that I like doing. So it will create uh, antagonisms or anger or employees feeling upset, and it'll decrease productivity. Sometimes differences in personalities can cause an issue as well. So if people don't get along, they've got a different sense of humour, or someone likes to work quietly, someone likes to be chatting. If someone uh, talks a bit loud and somebody else feels like they're being rude or they've got no authority, you know, then that will cause a disagreement at work. Again, different values is quite similar to different personalities. So if you've got different values, you know, um, that will cause issues and disagreements within your work team. So a difference in, val in values is actually clearly seen where you see a generational gap. So young workers might have a different type of work value compared to older workers. And it doesn't necessarily mean one is right and one is wrong. It's just that their values might conflict with each other. Older workers, for example, might say, I'm going to get these tasks finished, then I'll start a new one. Younger workers might say, no, I'm going to work on three or four different tasks at the same time. And it might antagonize the others and feel like you're not actually paying as much attention as you should or you're not taking this work seriously. And then the last point, and this is competition. So if you've got unhealthy competitions at work, that will cause conflict where you're trying to make more sales or you're trying to boost your um, bonuses and so on. Or you're saying that if your production is, if you do better than so-and-so, you'll get this instead. Or let's work towards who's going to win this particular prize at the end. Sometimes they can be unhealthy. Some competitions are good and it does strive and boost your employee morale. But some of them, it can just lead to employees sabotaging or each other or insulting each other or just having a hostile work environment. And it can be really unhealthy to be working in that type of situation. So on to 6.4. This is to explain the approaches people use to resolve conflict situation in work teams. So again, we've already discussed that conflict can happen in the workplace due to a variety of reasons. 
but it can happen in a variety of ways as well. It could happen between a couple of employees, between entire teams, or between supervisors and the team members that they're managing. So it, it, difficult issues can happen because as humans, we sometimes can be very emotional. We can get very distraught at certain things, or especially if we're feeling we're not being looked after or our loyalty is being tested, then issues can arise. So we're going to look at um, how we can resolve situations of conflict when you're working in a team. So you've got to embrace conflict. So when it does happen, don't avoid it. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend it's happened. You know, if you let it go on, tension will build and it will only get worse. So deal with these. So if you notice a conflict between your employees, encourage them to find a way to figure it out, to work it out, to actually try and solve these issues. Or you might have to go in and get someone to mediate. You might have to do it yourself. But it's very important that you get that addressed. So talk together. So set up a time and place where you can talk to each other, you know, without interruption. So it might be a one-to-one -one meeting in your closed office, or you might want to have a mediator there, and you might, just, or you might just want to listen to one side of the story at a time. But it's very important that you have a conversation. Don't let any one person monopolize the conversation or control the topic, but let everyone talk and hear them equally. Number three is to listen carefully. So when you're listening, when you've got that person in your office or those members in your office that are having a conflict, let them talk. Don't interrupt them. You know, don't talk over them. Because if you're doing that, you're going to give them a message that you're saying, I, I don't really want to listen to you. I'm not bothered about what you're saying. So let them talk. And when they're finished, clarify what you've heard just to make sure you've got the gist of it so things like so what i understand is or let me make sure i understand or so what i've heard is or what you're talking about and then you just summarize what you heard so you're upset about this this and that because of x y and z and so on so these clarifying questions will actually help you to understand that you know, you've heard what they've said, and again, it will give them the opportunity to listen to you, get the gist of what you said, and actually say, yeah, that is right, that's what I was talking about, I know, you've not understood, let me repeat myself. So you're getting to the gist of it in a good, effective manner. Find an agreement. So when you've had a conversation, primarily you're going to uh, focus on the disagreements. But if you can find a resolution and you can get to a point of agreement, that's fantastic. So try and find an agreement with that. So put you listen to the colleagues, what issues they had, what the grievances were. You've clarified it. And now you're going to shed a light on what all the commonalities are. So you're going to look at different examples and instances. And then you're going to see if you can find an agreement that all parties can uh, come to and be happy about agreeing with. And then you're going to provide guidance because you're in a leadership, uh, leadership position. There will be a lot of instances where you're going to have to mediate work conflict. You may personally not like conflict, but being in the position that you're in, it's important that you do this to stop them escalating. So you're going to be able to provide them guidance. Just be there to help your employees work out their problems. You know, have a good conversation. Go back, touch base with them, make sure that they're still okay. You know, if somebody's got hurt feelings, emotions will run high. And sometimes people will say things that they might regret later on. So take it with a pinch of salt. Give them a chance to cool down and then go ahead and just speak again. But whatever it is, if you've listened to the grievances and you've come to an agreement, just make sure that you go back and you, you don't just completely ignore them and think this is all fixed now. Touch base with them, make sure that they actually are okay with what you've said or if the agreement is actually working and the grievances are being addressed in a good manner. So now on to 
our merit and distinction questions. Let me just change the layout. There, much better. So 6M1 is analyze the characteristics of good interpersonal relationships with work colleagues. So here I'm just going to go through some characteristics of interpersonal skills and you're going to analyze them when you're doing your assignment. So we all need interpersonal skills to have a good, healthy relationship with our co-workers. And these are some ways to do it. So stay positive at workplace. So not everybody is perfect, but you don't need to be going in there with negativities or uh, pulling everyone down. Respect your colleagues. So don't behave unprofessionally. You know, don't misbehave with someone. Don't be rude to someone. You may not like a particular person, but that doesn't give you the right to go in and be rude to them or be bad mannered or to ignore them. Being cheerful out of the workplace is quite a nice one because smiling you know, just try and smile a little bit more often. Or when you see somebody, just give them a simple hello. Make your workers feel important. So show them that you care for them, that they acknowledge them and show that you appreciate their good work. Stand by your colleagues at the time of crisis. So don't throw them under a bus. If something's gone wrong, give them a sympathetic ear and listen to what is troubling them and then try and help them wherever possible. Um, to fix those crises or even just to talk them out. Be honest to others. So if one of your colleagues is doing something wrong, tell it to their face. Don't go and spread things to someone else and saying, oh, that uh, Jessica over there, she, she does this, that, that's completely wrong. I'm telling you, but make sure you don't tell that her now. That will pass on. We're gossips by nature. Unfortunately, there's things that we can't help ourselves. We do go and we do spread gossip. We do talk. It's, especially within the workplace, it's juicy information. Everything will get spread out. So if somebody is doing something wrong, you'll tell them to their face. They'll appreciate it better than having to hear it from a third or a fourth person or have it spread around the whole office and feel embarrassed about it. Be a patient listener, so actually listen to what the other person has to say. Understand what their point of view is and don't jump to conclusions. And then again, this is a simple one, but it's one that will get you a lot of respect. Is to be nice and kind to everyone. Be a source of inspiration and behave in a professional manner. You're there to be a role model, so they're going to look at your behavior. If you're stomping around, throwing things, slamming doors, or effing and blowing, or any of these things, then it, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to say, oh, it's okay, my manager does that. I can get away with this behavior too. Now on to 6M2, which has described the six-step conflict management process. So we're going to look at this method now. So the first step is to define the problem. So find out what the issue is and then investigate it. Then you're going to come together and communicate. So put a meeting together. Let everyone talk about what their issues or concerns are and do it without interrupting them. Number three is to establish relationships. So even if there's conflict going on, try and establish a relationship with everyone. You know, the ultimate goal is to be open, honest, and get two-way communication. So encourage everybody to listen to each other. I encourage them not to interrupt, and even if they don't agree, just to quietly listen. And then when it's their turn, they can talk. Four is to develop an action plan. So this is actually the real key after you've done all the other steps. So you've hashed out what the issues were. You've communicated the different grievances. Everybody's listened to each other. So now everybody should make a suggestion about what a reasonable solution is. If you let everybody within your team actually come up with an idea, they'll be more likely to stick to it rather than you telling them what to do. They might not be satisfied. They might feel disgruntled and say, oh, I've been given the short end of the stick. They're happy. They've got what they wanted, but I, I didn't get my issues addressed. So let them come up with an action plan themselves and then work towards tweaking it so it suits everyone. Gain commitment. So once you've agreed upon these, make sure that you gain a commitment. Don't 
let someone walk out and say, oh, I'll try or, you know, okay, maybe, let's see. If they're saying I'll try, it means that they're basically telling you this is not going to work. You need to get the phrases, I will do this. That's a good idea. I'm going to make sure that I copy this or I go down this route. And then number six is to provide feedback. So set up a follow-up meeting where you're looking at all those different parties that had the grievances. Just talk to them, get their feedback, find out are they okay? Is everything a little bit better now? Are the grievances being addressed? Has it sorted out any of these issues? Are they sticking to their plans or is there some sort of barriers that have happened that are stopping them sticking to these plans? And if so, deal with those straight away. Six D one, which is analyze the characteristics of an effective feedback. So on here, we've got step one is to have effective feedback which is specific, timely, meaningful and candid. So give them specific information, don't be generic. Give it as soon as possible for timely. It should be meaningful and you should be honest with them. Number two is to have effective feedback which is goal orientated don't just give them feedback about anything you need to make sure that it's actually tied into the goals of what that person is of the persons that you're speaking to number three is to have effective feedback which focuses on the future so you've got to understand that you can't change an event that's already happened you can't change something that's happened you can't go back and say oh you did this wrong and then they go back and they fix it it's not possible but you can tell them what went wrong so that they can change that behavior or that course of action for future um, enterprises or projects or goals number four is effective fit effective feedback is about the process it's not about the person so you're not going to be criticizing the person you're always going to criticize their actions or the actions that were done so when you're making suggestions make sure that you're doing suggestions about their actions and not about them personally number five is effective feedback isn't afraid to be negative so, you know, you're working in a team, you've maintained friendships, you might have been working for a couple of years together and you're quite chummy with them. You go out, you hang out, you have nice lunches together and you like each other. So it can be very difficult to give negative feedback to people that you formed relationships with. But it's important that you do it because it's feedback that is part of everyday communication it's not going to be misinterpreted it's not something special it's just saying that okay this particular task here what happened this action did not work out well so in the future you need to fix it by doing this that or the other or work towards a solution it's better to let them know exactly what the matter is rather than let them carry it down the track doing the same old and continuing the same issues that have been happening and number six is effective feedback can also be positive. So having positive feedback, it will stimulate the reward centers in the brain. So make sure you're specific about what you're praising someone for. Don't just say like we had before where it was your communication skills are great. Don't just give a generic sentence. Say exactly what you're talking about. Now on to 6G2, which is evaluate feedback to assess its effectiveness. Now for this here, you're going to need to do, gain some feedback from your manager, from your colleagues or from your friends at work. So get feedback about what your work practices are. Get positive feedback, ask them to give you negative feedback. Make sure that they're quite whole rounded. And then look at this feedback that they've given you, evaluate it and assess its effectiveness. You know, is it quite effective for you? Is there things in there that you weren't too sure about that you can actually change? Or is it quite what you were expecting? Number 